<clears throat> so pediatric patients, very similar to um, what we talked about with our with our neonatal patients. You know, they can just they can go, 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 and then suddenly just deteriorate on us pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> a general management that you want to keep up with is going to be obviously assess for their airway and breathing. Um, allow them to um, be in their position of comfort. Um, support the torso and spine for patients that are less than three years old. If they're three or older, you know, they might want to go and particularly be with somebody. Always keep in mind of uh, the foreign body airway obstruction. Um, and when you're clearing this uh, in our pediatric patients, remember that it's five back blows along with five chest thrusts. Um, again, for our infants, you don't want to be going and um, giving any um, Heimlich maneuvers or abdominal thrusts, and you don't want to necessarily go and perform any blind finger sweeps. When it becomes an uh, advanced clearing method, go ahead and pull out your McGill forceps, and you can go and uh, take out the object that way. If you're unsuccessful, attempt an in innovation around the foreign object, because, uh, you know, your airway is uh, uttermost important. Um, can, you might even want to consider a needle crike per medical direction, only as a last result, resort uh, for a complete airway obstruction. For children, you want to go ahead and perform those abdominal thrusts, suction, er, suction under five seconds for them. Make sure you oxygenate your patients. If your patients become unconscious, then go ahead and place an appropriate sized OPA, or you can even go and use your nasal trumpets. When you're ventilating, make sure you have the proper bag and you have adequate seal. Give a breath every once every three to five seconds. Assess for each chest rise and fall. When you go, prepare for your innovation. Make sure that you have your appropriate size blades, your tube, Braslow bag, Braslow tape, as we mentioned earlier. I always like having that out, dealing with any type of advanced maneuvers. It's all pretty, pretty straightforward. <laughs> okay, so when we're dealing with pediatric respiratory emergencies, um, you know, respiratory illnesses can be caused by compromising you know, um, our pediatric patient's life, you know. Um, some of them can be like an anaphylactic incident. Um, others can be um, due to uh, asthma. Um, but primarily, you know, as they always say that like, you know, pediatric deaths occur primarily due to a respiratory or airway injury um, problem. So when you recognize these type of emergencies, you'll notice that the distress uh, of the pediatric patient would be in the work of breathing. Um, <clears throat> carbon dioxide tension in the blood initially decreases, then increases as a condition deteriorates. If uncorrected, respiratory distress leads to obviously respiratory failure. Respiratory and circulatory systems are unable to exchange enough oxygen and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide tension blood will increase which leads to respiratory acidosis. A very ominous condition, patient is in a very, uh, on the verge of respiratory arrest when they, they get that. Um, when you get into respiratory arrest, it's a cessation of breathing. It's failure to intervene may result in a cardiopulmonary arrest. Good outcomes can uh, be expected with early interventions that, the, that prevent um, you having to perform CPR. Most cases of cardiac arrest in children are due to respiratory insufficiencies, upper and airway obstructions, along with lo lower airway diseases. Um, <clears throat> obviously, go ahead and grab your chief complaint. Do detailed of finding out what their past and their present histories are, along with some physical findings. Gauge where their normal mental status is. Be aware that, you know, typically, with some of, some of our respiratory pediatric patients that we come across, they do have um, congenital diseases or maybe even birth defects. So that's why we went over those those slides or I had you guys read that. Um, you know, they might have stomas and whatnot. So um, 
be aware that our special needs patients, you know, they, they um, particularly when they have respiratory problems, um, we might be running on those a lot of the time. And, um, and also that their parents or caregivers, like they, they know uh, quite a bit, an extensive amount of knowledge of like how their events work, how their um, um, suctioning devices work and, you know, what they can and cannot tolerate. So um, keep in mind that, um, or keep them in the loop in terms of maybe also your, your treatment considerations and whatnot. <clears throat> just hopefully you just don't have a language barrier. I find that a lot uh, in East LA, so. Um, <clears throat> But, um, you know, the, the traditional like signs and symptoms, you know, um, head bobbings and none of the grunting and whatnot, lethargy, low or high breathing rates. Respiratory failure would be agno respirations, poor muscle tone, marked tachycardia. Arrest would be limp muscle tone, bradycardia, asystole, profound cyanosis. Continuing your assessment. You want to make sure that there's an improvement due to good management, and this is indicated by an improvement in their color, improvement in their O2 sat, their pulse rate, and their level of consciousness. Manage your upper airway obstructions as needed, insert airway adjuncts, high flow O2. Make sure you're using your positive pressure ventilation, or if you need to, go ahead and get intubate the patient. Upper respiratory complications group. It's an upper airway viral infection that can lead to an, an airway obstruction. It's an inflammatory process of the upper respiratory tract involving the subclotic region caused by perineal influenza, ad, 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 adrovenous, and RSV. Most severe in uh, six to three year olds and occurs more frequently in the fall and winter. I know that my ER is getting certainly saturated with a bunch of peds right now. Group is contagious, spread by droplets and runs roughly two to, two to five day course of illness. Occurs most frequently in the middle of the night and usually without um, prior upper respiratory in infections. One way that I um, have helped like at least some of my, well for one, my own daughter, like she had a pretty bad congested cold and whatnot, but one thing I did is I, I stood in our restroom, blasted the hot water, and that warm humidified air definitely um, helped my daughter daughter like sleep through the night while well, we were like standing in there for like 20 minutes. So I always pass that on, uh, especially like when you're home, even like on a call. I haven't done it on a call, but you know, you can just be like, well, have you tried this? And see if you see any marks of improvement in case you want to get that refusal. Um, but of course, if the patient needs to go in and, you know, take them in. I hear that, I heard that like a freezer works really well too. Um, if you open up the freezer and you have that cool mist and whatnot, um, those can help alleviate some symptoms. Uh, you have that seal like bark. It's kind of funny. Like you hear about it, like EMT school. And then, you know, when you're obviously in medic school, like you, if you hadn't come across it, then you definitely have then. But, you know, just this hearing that seal-like bark, it's kind of fun. Because um, it is, it truly sounds like that. <clears throat> Here's a visual of what's going on. Some of the tissue being swollen. As I talked about, humidified or nebulized air. And obviously RSV in treatments. Blow-by usually helps a lot when they're in mom or dad's arms. Again, you don't want to agitate them, you know, make them as comfortable as possible. I actually saw this guy was actually talking, but he had a quarter. I think he was six years old, six year old. And the PA and I were looking at his x ray, and he was breathing just fine. He was talking okay, but he had a quarter right in the middle of his trachea, and it didn't occlude it. So it wasn't like facing down, but it was in probably you know, on that transverse type side, like from top to bottom, and you could just see it right then and there. I was pretty amazed. Um, obviously, like I, the kid had to be admitted for um, obstruction, but it wasn't like obstructing his full airway, which was pretty insane. So it does happen when it comes to the, the coins <laughs> type thing. 
I actually just I saw that X ray last week of that kid, and uh, yeah, it was it was crazy. <laughs> and I think the whole reason was is why he swallowed the quarter is that his brother dared him. So definitely keeps us in business, you know. <laughs> be aware of that respiratory arrest can be followed, and then also, uh, you know, you'll have to more than likely jump into a CPR if it doesn't um, subside. This is where that partial obstruction would be for that coin kid. You know, again, when you're having to get into your respiratory failure and arrest, you know, you want to innovate the patient, suction, notify, and get on the road as quickly as possible. Don't agitate these patients. I think a lot is another resp uh, upper respiratory uh, complication. Uh, that happens roughly between ages of three and seven, but it can occur at any age. It's uh, it's definitely a decrease from the administration of, of the flu vaccine that we get annually. It can be caused by the influenza. <clears throat> Basically, it causes cellulitis around the epiglottis, leading to an abrupt airway obstruction. Roughly 50% of children that have epiglottitis require an ET innovation. I think dro drooling is the key factor here on this one, epiglottitis. You have that drooling that's going on. So again, never attempt to visualize the airway if the patient is awake. That's a bad day. Caregiver, position of comfort, EVM if needed. If you have such a short transport time, then let the innovation happen at the ER. Forming chest um, compression upon the clotic visualization during innovation maybe produce a bubble at the tracheal opening. Innovation should be performed by the most experienced paramedic due to high degree of difficulty. Consider needle, crank, or medical control as a last resort. Notify patient status. Again, no agitation. And the thumbprint sign is the hallmark of epiglottitis. It resembles a thumb. It's pretty bad. Asthma. Okay, so 7% of children under 14 of age have asthma. Usually occurs in children that are two years of age or, or more. Uh, typically, in a child with a known history of having asthma, it's triggered by upper respiratory infections, allergies, changes in temperature, uh, physical exercise, or or not also an emotional response. Children that experience prolonged asthma attacks are easily um, tire easily and watch for signs for respiratory failure. Okay. So pathology would be like, you know, you have some bronchospasms, excessive mucus production, inflammation in the small airways, which all usually follows an exposure to a known type of trigger. <clears throat> you're gonna start, you're gonna go and hear those wheezes. You know, they're obviously gonna appear um, anxious and respiratory distress. When you have a silent chest, that means danger. It means there's no air movement. Again, make sure you have a clear airway and ventilate based on the distress level. All our usual indications of why we would do our treatments. If your albuterol nebulizer handy, it's an inflammatory process of the lower respiratory tract, including uh, terminal airways. May cause respiratory <clears throat> infection of the lower airways. Rails is, an, is one to keep in mind on this one. Pneumonia, respiratory distress or failure depending on severity. Oops. Again, appears anxious, decreased breath sounds. Rails, ronchi, um, pain in the chest, also having some fever. O2 is tolerated. Usual supportive care. That's the that's the word I've been looking for all day. Supportive care. Remembering that from my medic school days. Supportive care. Supportive care. All right. Um, when we have an FBAO, 
taller's maybe uncommon those lower airways treat your patients not the monitors treat shock remember various signs and symptoms of your compensated shock this is when you're definitely behind the eight ball a lot of treatments seem to go together right if your ammo company or your outfit, whichever, has a thermometer, try to get a temp. I see countless runs come into my ER and they just don't have temps. And I just think it's like kind of important. Like I know it's not necessarily like you can do anything about it, but like, I don't know. I just think having a temperature is relaying that is a, just kind of goes and gives a fuller picture of what's going on with this patient. And it just, just adds this one little element to it. Um, because countless time I, I hear LA City and LA County fighters like, oh, well, we don't take temps in the field. And I'm just like, why? Like, is it above you? Like, is it less of you? Oh, well, there's no way to determine accuracy. Well, I mean, like, at least if you know how to get the probe either in the butt or underneath their tongue, like, you can go and take a temp. I don't know. Um, I just, I just find it that, you know, if you can do it, you can. <clears throat> And because we have a lot of septic patients that come into our, our ER and stuff. And, you know, I don't know, like we get to it when, you know, we're assessing the patient and everything. But, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, you know what? We had this temp, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, cool. Let's go ahead and let's get blood cultures on, on board and get this going and whatever. Anyway. <clears throat> so remember that the type of shock of distributive shock can be a septic type of shock. Um, can be compensated or decompensated, and it's usually caused by a bacterial infection. The infants that might have this will appear very ill. Their skin is warm, the early stages and cold in the late stages. We look at their history um, for the type of neurogenic shock. They can present with a compensated or decompensated, depending on the severity caused by sudden peripheral vasodilation, like a traumatic injury, so remember that. You have some warming of the skin, bradycardic, um, impaired neurological functions. When you're when you're experiencing anaphylactic type of shock, um, presents um, you can have either uh, insect bites, antibiotic agents, venomous, food ingestion of various allergies, it might be vomiting or having diarrhea. Hives is a really key indicator, um, along with some airway swelling and wheezing, might experience some hypotension. Management, of course, is supportive care um, that you would normally do with high flow O2, um, your BVM, or your um, intubation if the parent, if the patient needs it. Remember your C-spine precautions when you're dealing with a trauma patient, obtain those peripheral IVs, the closest IQ available. <clears throat> when you're uh, dealing with medications to manage the specific types of distributed shock include dopamine for your neuro neurogenic shock. Epi will be given for your anaphylaxis. For cardiogenic shock, um, you know, again, that relates to adversely affects the heart function. Primarily in children, it's, uh, they have cardiogenic shock due to congenital abnormalities. So these cardiogenic PEDS patients would be feeling fatigue, chest pain, dysrhythmias, cyanosis. The severe cases of cardiac insufficiency in an infant may develop cardiogenic shock or a complete heart failure. Symptoms can present as a compensated or decompensated, depending on severity. You might, you'll hear some rails, you might even see uh, jugular vein distension. Hard to determine in infants and children, but you might see it. <clears throat> Obtain that history. You might hear some more crackles. Hypotension, peripheral edema, tracheal, excuse me, tachycardic, and 
um, tachyhypnea, so those high heart and um, respiratory rates. Again, um, your airway and ventilation treatments will be based on the stress of the patient. Possible administration of vasopressors, antihistamine meds, and diuretics. Fluid should be restricted on your um, volume overload to prevent all volume overload for your patients. So bradyrhythmias are fairly common in pediatrics, but your supraventricular tachydysrhythmias are uncommon along with VTAX. So with your tachydysrhythmias, your supraventricular tachydysrhythmias are usually found in infants with no prior history. The treatment will depend on the degree of the distress. If, you're, if you have your pediatric patient, your, um, this infant that's in SVT, um, what's one, and they're, and they, you know, they're fairly hemodynamically stable, you know, um, what's one intervention that you can do toward the baby? For SVT? Yeah. Oh man, it's been a while for, for Pete's. Yeah, it's okay. I, I just picked it up in my pals class last week. So, um, it's, uh, it's ice. It's, uh, go ahead and like, you know, have a bowl of ice and you kind of go and place that ice on the face. And um, um, it kind of, that's their vagal type of maneuver that would go and uh, um, get them trying to stimulate that vagal process. I've never personally have used it, but I found that that was kind of interesting to come across. All right. <clears throat> Uh, remember that your narrow complex tachycardia rates are greater than 220. Uh, maybe too present to uh, too fast or to count. So they're definitely considered unstable at that point. When they are unstable, you are going to have to go ahead and do immediate cardioversion for your tachydysrhythmias in these peak patients. So that's 0.5 to 1 joule per kilo. Increase the two joules if there's no response. Consider your amiodarone, which is five milligrams um, per kg over 20 to 60 minutes. And your other drugs that are there too, look out for your, remember your Lido, one milligram per kg for your wide complexes. There's those vagal maneuvers that I was talking about with the ice chips and the bowl of water. Kids, you know, just give them like a 10 cc or maybe a ten or five cc syringe and have them blow through it. Maybe remember look at your protocols. With again with our tachydysrhythmia, if a pediatric patient present with a stable VTAC is generally treated in the ED, drug therapy might be amiodarone, propiconamide, and lidocaine. VTAC that produces a pulse but shows signs of hemodynamic instability requires immediate cardioversion. VTAC without a pulse is treated the same as it would be BFIT. <clears throat> Radiocardias are the most common <clears throat> serious dysrhythmias in children. It usually develops as a result of hypoxia, but can be caused by acidosis, hypoventilation, hypoglycemia, or a central nervous system injuries. <clears throat> also may be developed in terms of vagal stimulation, so either a suctioning or ET2, ET2 attempts. Sinus bradycardia, sinal, so this is basically the sinal node arrest, so slow <clears throat> indioventricular rhythm and the AV block are most common pre-terminal rhythms in infants. Drug-induced causes can be digitalis toxicity. Infants with a history of heart surgery may have injuries to the AV node or within the conduction system leading to sick sinus syndrome or AV blocks. So heart rates less than 60, P waves may not be visible, QR restorations are prolonged, P waves are, and QRS complexes are not related. They present with compensated or decompensated shock. Again, it's bradycardic, um, it's less than 60 beats. <clears throat> Remember you have your ET tube route for medications. Watch out for those bradycardias. 
degenerating into a systole. Always get those patients on the pads as early as possible. <clears throat> Pretty straightforward. Always keep in mind of your H's and T's. Be wary, you might see torsades. So remember your <clears throat> mag dose. Okay, so with our mechanism of injuries in our pediatric patients, we'll find falls. The single most common cause of injury in our children it's a serious injury or death resulting from a truly accidental falls and relatively uncommon unless from a significant height. Motor vehicle crashes, the leading cause of permanent brain injury, and new cases of epilepsy for these peds, leading cause of death and serious injuries in children. Mechanism of injury uh, can be pedestrian versus vehicle crash, particularly lethal from trauma in children. Uh, initial injury due to the impact of the vehicle, which then faces, because they face the vehicle instead of turning to the side, um, you know, their extremities or their trunk. A children is thrown from the force of the impact, causing additional injuries to the head and spine upon impact with the other, other objects, such as the ground, another vehicle, a light stand, etc. Drownings is the third leading cause of injury or death in children between the ages of birth and four years of age. <clears throat> Approximately 2,000 accidental deaths happen due to drowning every year. Um, severe permanent brain damage occurs roughly 5 to 20% of hospitalized children. That's if they survive. Penetrating injuries, um, risk of firearms, um, Stab wounds from the fire and firearm injuries account for approximately 10 to 15 percent of all pediatric trauma admissions. Uh, visual inspection or external injuries can uh, not evaluate the extent of the external involvement. Burns, the leading cause of accidental death in the home for children under the age of 14 years of age. Burn survival is a function of burn of the burn size and um, concomitant injuries. We want to remember the rules of nines: abuse and neglect, which will be covered after this pediatric section, has been classified into four categories: physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and child neglect. So, social phenomena such as increased poverty, domestic disturbances. Younger age parents, substance abuse, and community violence have been attributed to the increase of abuse. Document all permanent findings, treatments, and interventions. Oh, this is horrible. Um, so the types of mechanisms will have some blunt trauma. So the thinner body walls allows forces of readily transmitted to the body contents. This is Predominant case of injury in children. Penetrating, becoming more of an increasingly problem in adolescence. Higher incidence in the inner city, significant incidence in other areas. And neck injuries are larger relative masses of the head and lack of neck muscle strength and provides increased momentum and acceleration and deceleration injuries, greater stress to the cervical spine region. Remember that you could have a C2 or C3 level for um, cervical mobility. And 60 to 70% of these pediatric cervical fractures occur in C1 or C2. Head injury is the most common cause of death in pediatric trauma patient victims. Um, Diffuse injuries are common in children. Focal injuries are rare, but those soft tissues, skull and brain are most um, compliant in children than adults. Significant blood loss can occur through the scalp lacerations and should be controlled immediately. It's uh, crazy to think about how vascular your head and face are. Um, Time in and time out. I mean, even when I was on the ride and showed up to an assault 
<clears throat> seeing, you know, you just see all this blood all over the place and it came from a small little nick on the face or even the head and stuff. So once you clear and wash, irrigate that area, you find it's just a little small little area. But um, <clears throat> especially when you're dealing with these pediatric patients, you know, they hit the corner of their, or their eyebrow on the edge of the uh, table and stuff, you know, reassure your, your um, the patient's parents or caregivers that, you know, like you, that you are controlling the bleeding and, and that the face is very vascular. All right. So this is your modified um, children's Glasgow coma scale. All right. You have the coos and the babbles and cries the pain. Everything else is kind of really similar to that adult. TBI is becoming a huge thing now, not only for the adults, but you know, any rec early recognition is aggressive management. Remember your intracranial pressures, um, and then some signs of it would be an elevated blood pressure, bradycardia, rapid deep respiration, so those cool small breathing, uh, progressing to slow deep respirations, alternating with rapid deep respiration, so those chain stokes. You have a bulging fontanelle in an infant, some posturing, asymmetrical pupils, possible seizure activity. Treatment would be high concentration of oxygen for a mild to moderate head injury. It's a GCS of nine to 15. Intubate and ventilate at normal breathing rate for severe head injuries that have a GCS of three to eight. Um, consider your RSI for medical direction. Maintain an inline stabilization in a neutral non-sniffing position. Administer 100% O2. Be prepared to assist with ventilation, intubate, place a gastric tube, OG tube, needle crack if needed. Traumatic chest injuries. <clears throat> chest trauma occurs in, in children under age 14, and it's usually a result from blunt trauma. Um, due to the compliance of the chest wall, severe interthoracic injury can be present without signs of an external injury. So your tension pneumo is poorly tolerated and is an immediate threat to life. Your flail segment is an uncommon injury in children when noted without significant mechanism of injury. Suspect child abuse has occurred. Any children with a cardiac tamponade will have no physical signs of a tamponade other than the hypotension. Abdominal trauma, the organs that are most commonly injured will be your liver, your kidney, or your spleen. Onset of symptoms would be rapid or gradual. Due to the small size of the abdomen, be certain to palpate only one quadrant, one quadrant at a time. Again, any child who's hemodynamic, hemodynamically unstable without evidence of obvious sources of blood loss should be considered as having an abdominal injury proven otherwise. Extremity injuries, it's the more common in children and adults. You want to worry about your growth plate injuries that can that will be common. Compartment syndrome is an is an emergency in children. Any sites of active bleeding must be controlled. Splinting should be performed. Prevent any blood loss. And PASG garments may be useful for unstable fractures, pelvic fractures, with hypertension present. So some, some special considerations when you have to immobilize. You utilize the appropriate size pediatric <clears throat> mobilization equipment. So your rigid collar or your towel, blanket roll, um, maybe use as a child safety seat. If You may use the child safety seat if it's not damaged. Apply that, um, apply the padding to any of the voids. You could use a, a papoose, or what I've actually liked to use is the CAD. The CAD has been very useful in my experience. <clears throat> Pad those voids. Of course, you have your 
um, backboards. When you're obtaining vascular access, interosseous catheters should be inserted into the large peripheral vein. Do not delay transport to gain that access. Initial fluids is 20 cc's per kg, either LR, NS, recess your vital signs. If you note that if you have, if you do not see any improvement after the second bolus, then there's likely to suspect a significant blood loss and they might need a rapid surgical intervention.